views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello everyone and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host Darren Jaime and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our community. Coming up on today's show, we'll find out how a public arts project enhances the visual landscape of our urban communities. And after that, it's been 45 years since the founding of the Young Lords in New York City. Find out how they were celebrated for their contributions to Latino rights. Also, Sharice Palomino will join the race to replace Council Member Vanessa Gibson, former seat in the New York State Assembly. We'll find out why she thinks she's the best choice. And then analyst Juan Carlos Polanco will come by and discuss some immigration reform and the GOP stand on the issue. And finally, are you ready for a natural disaster? Well, we'll tell you how to get your family ready and prepared for the next major storm. All this and much more is heading your way because right now we're officially open. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm your host Darren Jaime. Today is Wednesday, August 13th. Of course, you're watching Open, the only live and interactive program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. We want to encourage you to stay connected to us so you can find out more about us on Twitter at BronxNet TV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Well, our first guest on the show is looking to fill the seat of the 77th District that was left vacant when former State Assemblywoman Vanessa Gibson ran for the City Council and won in 2013. She's here to discuss her work and position on several issues. We now welcome the candidate for the State Assembly, Ms. Sharice Palomino here. And Sharice, good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we want to kick off the show talking politics. And of course, as we <laughs> know, uh, you know, the Assemblywoman, former Assemblywoman Gibson, yeah. is uh, moved on to the City Council. So the first question is, why for you, the State Assembly? Well, you know, I've been working in the community for over five and a half years, um, providing direct social service work in the community, working particularly with young people. And I was inspired by them, seeing that, you know, there's so many limitations in what we can do with our kids. I work in a nonprofit in the Bronx, and, you know, we get a lot of government funding. And there's a lot of limitations in what we can do to achieve some of the goals that we want to achieve with our young people. So I want to go to the State Assembly so I can advocate for better policies, more funding, and better structure when it comes to that. I have a grant right now that is funded directly from the state, and there's limitations in what we can do with our kids, and that goes with many of the grants that we get from the government. So I want to be able to help set the tone and fight for the young people in our community and our community overall. And when you look at working with young people, obviously you have to have boots on the ground, knowing that they're involved in the educational system. It is so much challenged here in New York City. I know you have a position in terms of education. What would you like to see done uh, in regards to education, particularly for the kids in our borough? Well, there's a lot of things that need to happen with education. One of the one of the more controversial issues with education is Common Core, and that was recently um, implemented in New York State. And what it did was it raised the standards for education. And we have a lot of low performing schools in the Bronx, and we need to fix that. We need to change it. You know, education is obviously a gateway to a better socioeconomic life for our young people and their zip code shouldn't dictate how far they can go in life and previously the education standard was here a lot of our kids were here and Common Core has raised it here and there's a huge gap in the achievement you know we have an elementary school in the district that has less than 10 percent of the students performing at grade level for both English and for math, and that's unacceptable. We need to be able to bridge the achievement gap for the young people in our community. Moving on a little bit, let's talk a little bit about uh, economy. You know, you got the whole economy, you've got small businesses, and small businesses are really the core of, of America's heart. Here in the borough of the Bronx, uh, a lot of businesses are suffering, a lot of businesses are having some challenges. Your proposal to deal with uh, the economy and small business. Well. I've been talking to people, who, you know, some of the small business owners in the community, and there was a, a man who owns a bodega, and one of the challenges that he's facing is that he can't get loans from the banks because he's a small business, and 
there's limitations on how much they can take out being such a small business and so he's applied for federal loans and then the problem that he's faced is that when he has to repay his loans he's making a decision does he restock his store or does he pay his loans back and so we need to make sure that we can provide initiatives or establish initiatives at the state level that could provide our small businesses with micro loans so that they can have small quantities of money just to help supplement the challenges, the temporary challenges that they may be facing and that can help, you know, upstart their business and keep it rolling and instead of putting them further in debt by taking out larger loans with higher interest rates and making it more difficult for them to pay back. Because no business owner should be in a situation like this bodega owner is where he has to make a decision about stocking his store or paying back loans. Mm -hmm. So we need to do better at the state level. You're an advocate for raising the minimum wage? Absolutely. You know, um, I believe that New York sh City should have, n I believe that this New York City should be able to set the minimum wage that's appropriate for New York City. Straight across the state, having a flat minimum wage isn't applicable to everyone. You know, the cost of living in New York City is sky high. So many of us live paycheck to paycheck. You know, um, you have people who ha earn $50,000. If they were living anywhere else, they could survive with that. But having a $50,000 a year job, you're bound you know, paycheck to paycheck, and that's not acceptable. And we need to raise the minimum wage so that more people have access to purchasing stuff, they can pay for housing, and that they have money to live. And it's not acceptable that we have a system that's set up in a way that it makes it very difficult for the middle class to survive. So when we talk about minimum wage and we look at the fact that so many New Yorkers are just struggling, try to, trying to make it, period, yeah. and minimum wage not being, not being applicable what message do you send to those lawmakers up in Albany right now if you could send a message right now what would be that message well when I get elected the message that I'm gonna send is that you know raising the minimum wage 75 cents last year isn't good enough you know we can't beat our chest and say we, we won with 75 cent increase you know there's too many people struggling to survive when you look at a lot of the data it's it's crazy mm -hmm. you know I mean um, New York Magazine has, an, uh, on their website, they have uh, the map of the train line. And as you're rolling up the train line, it shows you what the median income is. And in some parts of the Bronx, it's $15,000, it's $26,000. And the average cost for an apartment in our community, a one bedroom in the 77th district is $954. If you're making $26,000 and you have to pay taxes on it, how do you survive? Right. That's the problem that our community is facing. And I'm going to go to Albany and I'm going to fight for an uh, increase in minimum wage. When you look at the 77th district and you look at it overall, what would you say is the biggest challenge affecting the district that if you had to go to Albany and say, listen, my district needs, what would be at the top of the priority list? Well, it would be two things. It would be affordable housing and it would be better education policies. You know, we have a lot of low performing schools and we need additional funding for those schools. Instead of shutting the schools down, we need to revamp how they're operating. We need to put money into those schools. We need to invest in those schools so that we can abridge the achievement gap that I was talking about earlier. There's so many limitations with our kids when they can't go far because of how little education they're getting. I work, in an, I work with young people, and we have kids who are in high school who can't write essays. You know, I had a young person that was sitting at my desk with me and couldn't multiply 25 times 6. And no one should be in high school struggling with those basic skills. And that is one of the biggest problems that our community is facing, is how bad our schools are performing. So give us your platform for those people who want to know what does Sharice Palomino stand for, what would it be? Education, housing, veterans issues. Um, veterans issues is important to me because it's a, it's a my brother is enlisted in the Army Infantry. Um, he's not a vet yet, but one day he will be. And so some of the challenges that we have on the federal level with the vets is unacceptable. We shouldn't be dishonoring our vets by giving them long waiting periods at, ho at, at hospitals. They shouldn't be limited in how much money that they're getting. And they shouldn't, I'm, I met a vet as I was campaigning who said he was two years behind in his benefits. We shouldn't dishonor honorable service that our men and women put their lives on the line for our freedom, for our democracy, for our country. We have to do better. And I think Albany can do better. We can fill in some of the gaps at the state level that we have at the federal level so that we can make sure that our, benef our veterans are taken care of. So how would you say you describe yourself as standing away from the rest of the candidates that are running? 
Why should people vote for Sharice? People should vote for me because I have a proven track record. I have been working in this community for five and a half years. I live and I work here. I've been an advocate for women's rights. I've gone to Albany to advocate for the Women's Equality Act, and I will continue to advocate for the Women's Equality Act because it didn't pass two years in a row. I went to Albany to advocate for the decrease in the speed limit, and we were successful with that in June. Um, I've been working directly with our young people. I understand education because I'm in the trenches, and that's one of the things that separates me from the rest of the field. I do this social service work, and I I bring a vision that the other candidates aren't going to bring. I see from the policy side how limited the state policy is in what we can achieve in our community when nonprofits and community-based organizations are then doled out these grants and contracts to provide services in the community. I'm coming from the other end where I see where the limitations are, where I can fight for what's really necessary and that a lot of times these government programs, they don't include some of the variables and challenges that our community faces. There's an expectation that we should be able to achieve these things, but then there are, there are variables. You mm -hmm. know, there are different things happening in people's lives that make it difficult to ascertain some of the goals that the government's setting out. And so I have that experience, and, I have, and I've built my entire adult life around that. And so I think that's what separates me from the rest of the candidates. Well, Sharice Palomino, we gave you the kickoff here at Open, and so thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. And, uh, We'll continue to follow the candidacy as it goes along. All right. Thank you so much for having me, Darren. All righty. Sharice Palomino, she's a candidate for the 77th Assembly District, and uh, we'll continue to follow that race here on Open. Got to take a quick break, but when we come back, well, let's say right now, how about we take a look at how the Bronx celebrated its 100th anniversary with three pedestrian Sundays on the Grand Concourse. Now, this Sunday, the 17th, is the last time to boogie on the boulevard in our Bronx that correspondent has more on the story. Ready for a day of fun in the sun? Come with us as we enjoy what Boogie on the Boulevard has prepared for us. For three consecutive Sundays, the Bronx will be celebrating its Boogie on the Bronx Festival. Here we showcase free music, activities, and programs promoting fitness and well-being. Encouraging people to come outside, be more active, it's healthy, uh, it really does help speak to some of the issues that we have here with childhood obesity and so on, so it's good to get people out. I mean, this community came together two years ago because they wanted to restart this great party on the Grand Concourse, and local art institutions and community groups and transportation alternatives and the city worked together to put this event back on again really an opportunity for us as Bronx residents to recognize how important health is and by promoting opportunities of bike riding, of walking, we're really showing that fitness is important. It's important for children, it's important for families. You can have just as much fun as I think. And don't worry, there's plenty who has to go around. Come on down to Grand Concourse on August 17th for a day of adventure. This is Jayla Lluveras reporting for Bronxland. Jimmy can't sing, and Tommy can't dance, so we're going to put some ants in their pants. Aww. Kids will spend 22 minutes watching us, the super duper party troopers, sing about ants in their pants. Isn't that funny? Ants in their pants, they got ants in their pants, they got ants. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. Back here on Open, Darren Jaime here with you. The immigration crisis has become a major issue for the United States with current resolve. According to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, 57,525 undocumented immigrant children under the age of 18 and traveling without a parent or guardian were apprehended between October 1st, 2013 and June 30th of 2014. Here now to discuss the issue is former president of the New York City Board of Elections and uh, also a professor 
And uh, we're pleased to be joined by Mr. Juan Carlos Polanco, better known as J.C. Polanco. Good to have you, man. Hey, thanks, Darren. Thanks for having me back. Good, good, good. I know we're glad to have you and really um, sharing light on this particular topic. The GOP has been uh, very outspoken on the issue of immigration. Some say uh, the conservative rank has really uh, said immigration should not happen, and they've really taken a forceful position. I want to get your thoughts on, on first of all, the whole immigration reform from the Republican Party perspective. You know, I have to tell you, the, the far right wing in our party is unfortunately stirring up uh, kind of uh, a language that keeps Hispanic voters from voting Republican. Uh, but the reality is that uh, the Republican Party supports immigration as a whole, and it supports legal immigration. Um, the, what we're seeing today is a very interesting debate is how do we handle over 11 million undocumented immigrants that are currently in the United States? Right now we have close to 60,000 uh, kids. And we say kids, these are people that are under 18 years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, that are here without parents. And it was a law that was passed by President Bush. Um, and it's impacting Americans directly because where do we send these kids? These kids are fleeing their homes because of gang violence, certain death, poverty. And when they come to the United States, they're being sent to places like Long Island, for example, and states uh, across the country far away from home. Uh, the issue that we're having currently is how do we handle this, uh, this crisis? Um, what, we're looking right, what we're looking at right now, uh, Darren, is the breakdown in the American political system. You know, we, sure, we have Democrats and Republicans, but it, there is no secret that the extremes on both parties run the debate. Mm -hmm. um, and the extremes on the left as far as the extremes on the right. And what we're looking at is a House of Representatives that is controlled by the Republicans. But sadly, there is a small number of very right-wing Republicans that are using terrible language. Uh, they call themselves Republicans. I just call them far right-wing. They're, they're, mm. they, they don't share the ideology that many Republicans share. And the type of language that they're using to describe these people that are here um, illegally um, is wrong and it's going to cost us the White House uh, for many, many years to come. And I want to talk about this because you got former Alaska Attorney General uh, Dan Sullivan, you got Lieutenant Governor Matt Treadwell, and uh, their com their comments basically saying, uh, menacing Hispanic gang members, you know, referring to those persons as menacing Hispanic gang man members, and yet and still coming back and saying, I stand by what I say. This is going to have a, a damning effect, if you will, on the Republican Party. 2016, yes, no. There's no question it will. You know, again, I have to tell you, the primary elections in this country are really controlled by the extremes. Um, it's who can move further to the extreme of their base in their party. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in Alaska um, is uh, Republican candidates that are pushing so far to the right on this matter that you, they're using language that is going to ultimately hurt us. Let me give you an example. We have over 24 million eligible voters that are Hispanic in the United States. Over 11 million of them voted in 2012, and well over 71% of them voted for President Obama. If this language continues, we're going to continue losing Hispanic support. You know, this issue of immigration is one that is very important to Hispanics. It cuts across uh, racial lines in the Hispanic community. It cuts across ethnic lines because all Hispanics, in part, can relate to the immigration experience. And they feel that they're being attacked when this type of language is used. Unfortunately, what we're looking at is a Republican Party in certain districts in this country that continue to move to the right, and it ultimately is going to hurt our chances of winning the White House. But this is important to note. Um, this immigration crisis is something that has to be handled right. Uh, I'll give you an example. We're looking at a country right now where the border is not secure. We're looking at a country right now where we have over 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, many of which we don't know their background. Many of them live among our neighborhoods. We don't know who they are. Um, the reality is that these people have broken American law. They have. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think the far left doesn't want to admit. Um, how do we handle the reality that these people have broken American laws, these people are here illegally, and there has to be some sort of agreement between the right and the left? Let me give you an example. Okay, before you give the example, let me sure. give you, how does the GOP craft a message that's well, going to attract? Because, listen, if you don't craft the right message, you're definitely not going to be able to attract those persons when you come to, when it comes time to go to the polls. Da Darren, you know, both parties are to blame in this issue. If you look at the uh, Immigration Reform Act that came out of the Senate, oh, the House of Representatives, and I have to tell you, they've, they've pretty much have said in all their talking points, if you secure the border, we'd consider a path to legalization. You know, if you're considering that the Republicans in the House are bluffing, then call them on their bluff. Compromise on securing the border. Put a fence up and then look at the Republicans in the House and say, now what? And call them out. 
But the reality is that there has to be compromise between the right and the left. Here, the right is saying, you secure the border, we'll focus on some sort of path to legalization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems as if the far left and the Democratic Party, they don't even want to negotiate on securing that border, whether it be constructing a fence, militarizing the border. I would compromise and say, you get your secure border, you offer 11 million families here a path uh, to legalization. And that's true immigration reform. But we need to address this issue head on and just blame me one party over another. It's not going to get it done. But the Republican Party has to tone down its message and the leaders in the Republican Party have to make a decision. It's either we're going to appease the far right in those obscure districts out in Alaska and in uh, Texas, um, or we're going to continue losing elections and ultimately the White House for elections to come. How big do you feel immigration will be coming in the next election? I think it's very important whether you're Irish, Italian, or Hispanic. Immigration is an important uh, it's an important issue for you. Now, sure, there's always the argument of uh, legal immigration versus undocumented immigration, and I understand that. But we have to be very careful with the language. Consider that in 2030, the Pew Research Institute has Hispanics at over 40 million red, uh, eligible voters ready to go. Uh, if we do not take care of the immigration issue, or we don't do it humanely, we don't do it by treating these people that are here um, undocumented with respect, we're going to lose the White House, but continue to win these districts in Texas. So you have to make a decision. Either you're going to narrow your message and be inclusive in your language and attract Hispanic voters by providing a path to legalization, providing an understanding to the history and the political conditions of Latin America, or you've basically written off the White House for many years to come. In 2004, 44 percent of Hispanics voted for President George W. Bush. In 2012, that number is over 75 percent against the Republican Party and for President Obama. And those numbers will continue to increase if the language doesn't change. It's important that the Republican Party's leadership recognizes that you have two choices to make. It's either the White House down the road or those districts in Texas. No, let me put you, let me put you, I know we gotta go, but let me put you in a situation room. You're in a situation room talking to a bunch of Republican leaders. You're saying, listen, this is the message that I would say to say, to really convey that we might be able to win the party and win the House. What do you say? I say um, immediately you have to cut off this discussion about treating uh, all Hispanics that are here undocumented as if they're criminals. Uh, that's not the case. I think you have to recognize that the overwhelming majority of the people that are here undocumented are hardworking, want nothing more than to contribute to the fabric of American society, and they're looking for a path to, to legalization that must be addressed. Over 11 million of them reside in the United States today. We can continue calling them illegal and treating them as such, and can, they'll continue uh, when they get an opportunity to finally vote or their kids get an opportunity to vote, they will vote against us. So we have to figure out a way to include them in the American process. Now, keep in mind that this is a very tough topic because you have people that are standing in line trying to do the right thing and coming into the United States legally. What do we say to those hundreds of thousands of people that are standing in line? What do we say to those people that have actually done the right thing and coming here legally? So it's not cut and dry. I understand the, the concerns that many Republican voters have, but politically, mm -hmm. you have to understand that we are set to lose the White House for many elections to come if we don't change the rhetoric. All right, J.C. Belongo, that's why we bring you here. You give us the uh, information that we need to hear. We'll bring you back. Thank you for coming to share with us. Thank you so much, Eric. All right, I got to take a quick break, but when we return, going to find out how you can get prepared for the next major storm. We've had storms in our area. We want you to be prepared. Stay with us right after this. For those dealing with the struggles of caring for a loved one, we hear you. Visit aarp.org caregiving for advice and support. People think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today, I'm just an aluminum can, but one day, I could be a stadium. for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time.
Every day, kids witness bullying. Why are you stabbing me with it? They want to help, but don't know how. Teach your kids how to be more than a bystander. Visit stopbullying.gov. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. Well, as many in New York and the outer boroughs are trying to recover from yesterday's major storm inches, about 13 uh, of rain, questions now surface. Are you ready for the next major storm? Our next guests have joint ventured to promote disaster preparedness month in September. They're hoping to enlighten both the Bronx residents as well as business owners on how to prepare for future disasters as well as storms in particular. Here now to tell us more is the CEO of Disaster and Immediate Evacuation, Barrington Polite, and George Williams of Open Choice IT Services. And welcome both to the show. Thank you guys for coming and sharing with Thank us. Thank you for inviting us. Barrington, I guess this comes at a good time. And, you know, on the, on, on the heels of this major storm that we've had, we see a lot of people, particularly Westchester County, uh, Long Island, really trying to suffer and get back from these flooding rains. Uh, and then you look around, this isn't the first time we here in New York have had to deal with severe storms. I'll start with the, the, the operative question. Do you think that New Yorkers as a whole are really prepared for storms? Well, thank you for having us, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, being prepared is in the eyes of the beholder. So it's what matters to you. Uh, we have roughly 9 million folks in New York City. Uh, 19, roughly 19 million in the whole state of New York it is impossible to do mitigation planning for all those people. So we want you to take responsibility for yourself. For example, what happened in Long Island, what happened in College Park, these things are inevitable to happen. You can't stop storms or hurricanes from happening. It's mm -hmm. what you do afterwards, it's the aftermath. That's why we have this thing called the cycle of emergency management, which is prepare, recover, and make sure that your family is prepared. Mm -hmm. And this is a cycle of emergency management. You have to be able to dig yourself out of whatever is going on at that moment and respond appropriately. Because as we learned in 9-11, all the FDNY personnel was dispatched to go downtown. So if something happened to your home, your family, whatever the case is, who's going to put out fires? who's going to help you prepare, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So we do basic trainings, we get the information out there. Disaster and media evacuation is actually a hub, an information hub. Mm -hmm. We want you to be prepared. And George, for businesses, there's also services available to help them as well. That is true. Uh, whether or not you're a bodega or you're, you're a restaurant, uh, th there are certain services and things that you as a uh, business owner w want to do. Uh, you want to uh, make copies of your or le electronic copies of your important information. So should you have a disaster, you can have that information at hand and be able to recover it after a disaster and get your business up and running very quickly following that disaster. So what we're hoping to do is put on a workshop and an expo in the uh, Bronx with the, uh, with the aid of the uh, uh, Bronx SBDC and to really educate more uh, in September and October, which, uh, which we're at the height of the uh, hurricane season. Mm -hmm. So we got workshops and expos coming around the corner, huh? Yep, that's what we're planning. So let's know a little bit about it. Well, the workshops are basically going to show uh, businesses, you know, what information is important to them, what information they can back up, and how. A lot of times you have existing technology or existing ways of just storing your information either online or even at another location at your home or a secondary location where when there's a disaster, you can actually go to that and work. Let's say if you have a fire, that's a form of a disaster, you can quickly get your business um, up and running uh, working with your insurance company. Let's say you would have the, that documentation there. What we find is a lot of times with a very uh, sudden disaster or, or uh, event, a lot of the owners don't have that information and uh, their insurance policies take a long time to really get back to them because that information isn't presented in a timely 
fashion. Mm -hmm. Baron, so once again, for people that he talked about businesses, but what are ways that New Yorkers, Bronxites, can really prepare for these disasters? Because I think when Hurricane Sandy hit, I've always said New Yorkers are resilient. We walk around like right. we have with a chip on our shoulder. It can't yes. really affect us. But Sandy really showed us that we're not as invincible as we think that we are. Yes, uh, Sandy was the knockout punch. And we have a basic training in New York City under the Office of Emergency Management. I am a member of the CERT program. That stands for Community Emergency Response Team. It's a basic training. A 10-week course, I like to say 10 days because it's one day a week. Mm. When you say 10 weeks, then people go, oh, gosh, I'm going to go to this training for 10 weeks. But it's 10 days. You're going to get basic training. You're going to get uh, triage, how to triage a person in case of emergency. You're going to get light search and rescue. You're going to get how to direct traffic. This is basic training that the city offers you under the Office of Emergency Management through certain members like myself in different boroughs. There's about uh, 15, there should be about 12 teams in each borough, and you can join us for free. And the next class will be coming up, I believe, in September to, or the end of September. Now, this is just for basic training. If you want to do something more advanced, then you would come to disaster and immediate evacuation and get advanced training. Mm -hmm. So we want you to be able to have this training so you can get yourself and your family out first or whatever the situation may, may occur. You may have to shelter in place. Yeah. If something happens here, we all have to stay in this studio for the next four days. How do we do that? So that's called mitigation planning. So we want to do those things, and in conjunction with what George is doing, that's all about preparing and having a positive response to these things that happen. Because it's not just about weather-related stuff. It is about the everyday occurrences that happen vis-a-vis -vis the gun shooting, the things that happen every day, the explosions from the manholes. How do we respond to these things? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, you know, and amazingly enough, people really don't think about it because right. you're just going from day to day right. doing what you do. Yes, and right. especially when you talk about a business owner, I think for a business owner, just to manage my business on a day to day basis is enough. That's right. Not to think about, well, if a fire comes or something like that, where, where my paperwork is. So uh, give some tips or some information that we can help people out with. Well, the, the number one tip is start right away. You know, you don't have to do everything at one time. Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> Just, you know, locate your, your important information, step one. Step two, um, you know, place it where you, you can uh, have it next to either, either a copier or a scanner. You know, get an intern and have an intern come in a couple of hours a week and actually, you know, scan in your information. Then when you, once you scan it in and you, you have it in an electronic format, copy it and copy it off either to, you know, an off-site location or just, hey, take it home and store it in a lockbox where you, you can get to it if you, you know, have a disaster. Nowadays, the cloud seems to be like the place where a lot, is the are, place. a lot of people are hanging their stuff. Yes. That's right. All righty. So for people who want more information about the Business Expo how to, uh, and, and the workshops available, how do you? I would say you can contact the Bronx SBDC, uh, mm -hmm. Small Business Development Center, or you could go to our website, which I, I think you're displaying at mm -hmm. some point. Yeah, it's right there at the bottom of the screen, so right. we'll make sure you go on out there and get some information. And gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing. And of course, we'll keep that information on our website so that way people can become aware. And I, like I said before, you know, so many times we think that we got it under control until it hits. Yes. And then we find out just how bad we are prepared. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming thank and sharing. You. Thank Very you. Very much. All righty. Got to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to see how the young lords of New York City were celebrated on their 45th anniversary. We have an inside look. We'll be right back. shoulders your shoulders it's a three-tier muscle you have your front delt you have your rear delt and you have your mid delt so when you're working out your shoulders properly you have to do three different exercises
it's wonderful being able to compete with a lot of these young guys from all over the world. It's important to stay in shape. Hello, I'm Don Lemon from Open 2.0 and Broadcast, the show by teens, for teens, and about teens. Catch us every Friday at 4.30 and anytime on the web by going to www.bronxnet.org. Hi, this is Jeff Fox for 107.5 WBLS. And when I get off the radio, I check out my man, the Dr. Bob Lee. It's open on Bronxnet. I never miss it. They saw Dr. Bob Lee and Fred Bugs and uh, Jeff Red. Listen, everybody's watching Open and Bronxnet Television. You're watching Open right now. And guess what? During the 60s, it was a chaotic time. There's a group of young Latinos united and organized around themes of identity, health, political oppression, economy, and self governments forming the Young Lords in Chicago as well as New York. And on the 45th anniversary of the founding of the Young Lords in New York City, a new street sign was unveiled, Young Lords Way. And here now to tell us more is the activist for Latino and Puerto Rican rights, Mickey Melendez, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Good, good, and congratulations uh, on the uh, accomplishment and the achievement. All right, it's an accomplishment for the entire community, not just for the Young Lords. So. Well, well, when you talk about it being for the community, and you say not just for the Young Lords, let's break that down a little bit, because the Young Lords really had a heart and mind for the community. Well, there was no separation. That's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm basically what I'm saying. Um, the Young Lords um, came to New York City um, with the same commitment and militancy that the Black Panthers did uh, for their community. Um, they were a fraternal organization. I guess people relate to us as the, young law, as, as the Black Panthers in the, in the black community. Um, and the things that we did, there was very, you know, um, there was unity and unison between us and the community. We got tremendous support from the community. That's why we got away with a lot of the things that we did, like burning garbage, like hijacking a uh, TB truck, taking over a church. Um, and um, so it's, it's not just the young lords. It's the young lords that represents a particular era. Mm -hmm. of our history here in New York City. Now, now, back in the day, that would be considered, and today it's considered extremely radical, some of the things that you guys did. Right. Uh, give us a little bit of a background as to why so radical. Well, you know, when garbage isn't being picked up, and you pick up garbage and the sanitation doesn't pick it up, and all of a sudden matches and lighter fluid, um, you know, appear, and garbage is burnt, um, and then all of a sudden it's picked up. I don't think that that's radical. I think that that's circumventing government and forcing government to do what they're supposed to do. When we test um, young children for a TB and nut testing, um, something that the government doesn't do, um, again, I think that that's circumventing. When we take over a TB truck because they wouldn't park the truck, where we had 150 people waiting to be x-rayed that had been positive. Um, and you hijack a truck and you demonstrate to government how things are done when you have community alongside of you. When you take over a hospital, um, today the Lincoln Detox program is still there, recognized by the World Health Organization of the United Nations. We took over Lincoln Hospital November 10, 1970 for the establishment of a drug program where one out of every four persons in the Mott Haven area of the Bronx was addicted to heroin and no services in the Bronx. Take over colleges for the establishment of black and Puerto Rican studies programs. Um, I, I don't think that those are radical things. I think that those are things that uh, needed to happen for our community and move forward. And when you look at the accomplishments that you were able to achieve, you look, there's still a similar struggle today as an OG, if you will, mm -hmm. talking to the, young, the newer generation. What advice would you give them in terms of meeting the goal and making it happen? Well, you know, before you, before you organize, you have to educate yourself, you know, and, and education is, is, is really a history, you know, knowing who you are, how did you get here, um, and what are your challenges, you know, based on, on what came before you. Um, I think we have very similar challenges today. I mean, you know, Latinos, uh, Puerto Rican and Latinos are still graduating at a slower rate from high school. Um, you talk about some of the health indices, you know, in terms of tuberculosis and diabetes. Um, you know, all of these issues are still there in our community. I think what's lacking, and, and one of the things that we failed to do was that we didn't institutionalize a lot of the things that we did. So it, it's not an intergenerational. We have a lot of young people now um, that are looking back at that era to try to find some answers to try to figure out how to move forward. When you look at the Young Lords, you talked about fighting for Latino rights. What were some of the biggest challenges for you 
uh, as a Latino coming up in the back in the day? Well, you know, first of all, we went to school in the you know, 50s and 60s, and we were told, you know, you're in America, don't speak Spanish. So you go home and, you know, your parents are speaking Spanish. So, I mean, what's, why, you know, what's wrong with mom and dad? Or, um, so it, it was this process of really understanding who we were and re-identifying ourselves um, and understanding that we're European, that we're African, and that we're indigenous people. And then identifying ourselves in a history that goes back to 1868, mm -hmm. um, which were revolutionary nationalist people. Um, they fought against slavery, they fought against imperialism in the early 20s, the Nationalist Party did the same thing, but we were separated from that history. Very similar to young people today being separated from a history of 45 years ago, never mind 1868. When you go down to 111th Street and Lexington Avenue, that is now known as Young Lord's Way, the unveiling of a new sign and, you know, to have a street named after Young Lord's Way. What does that mean for both you as well as the, as well as the organization? Well, this was an idea that came up from um, Vicente Panama Alba, took it to Debbie Quinones from the community board there. Um, we did all the petitions, and um, basically then it was given to the, at the then just councilwoman of the area, which is Melissa Mark Vivido. Um She uh, submitted it, and um, strangely enough, um, Bloomberg and, and um, um, Christine Quinn said that, they were, that there were about 40 of them to be done. They were going to stop it um, if, if we were going to go ahead with this. Melissa Marvi Vodito basically had to get Bloomberg together with the Hunter College Center for Puerto Rican Studies and give him an education on this piece. So basically by that time it was kind of late in his term and um, Melissa basically asked us if we could wait because we knew that there was a Democratic mayor coming in and it, and it would be a lot easier. Um, basically what it means for us is, is that you know, we pass on to the annals of um, the historical history of the city and our contribution to there. I just passed by there um, yesterday, I think it was, and it was the first time I was there since July 26, which is the actual anniversary. And it was just really nice to see that up there for young people to come and just see the churches right across the street. The church that we took over to uh, because they didn't have, uh, they were only open once a week. Mm -hmm. We wanted to have breakfast programs, we wanted to have free medical care. Um, now today they have a free breakfast program and a lunch program. So as you talk about being an activist, you're still an activist. I am. And so talk about what you're doing now. Well, one of the things that we're, we're, we're thinking of doing, only because of young people came to us and basically said, listen, we don't want to wait till the 50th anniversary. Some of you guys may not be around. Mm. Um, so one of the things that people are thinking about doing now is a Young Lord's Way street festival um, right around the anniversary, um, where we will close down the street and have some music, have some poetry, but have a, a different kind of street festival, have some community-based organizations, have some NGOs, um, so that people can connect as volunteers. The slogan of the street fair is gonna be in the spirit of service. In the spirit of service. And we want you to come on down to 111th Street and Lexington Avenue. There you can see Young Lord's Way, and then you can have an opportunity to see the street actually renamed. And then also watch us, because now you've seen exactly all that has gone on. Out of all, because you've had a multiplicity of experiences, what to you would be uh, the biggest and the most memorable out of all of the, out of all, all the Young Lord's work? Out of all the actions? Yeah. You know, I, I think because it's still there, it was the establishment of the um, detoxification program at Lincoln Hospital. And it wasn't only the detox, detoxification of the program, but it was also to build a new hospital. That hospital had been condemned for 20 years. Um, it was okay for us because it was people of color in the South Bronx to keep it running. Um, but that takeover also propelled the building of the new hospital. And in fact, there was one institution that we did build, which is still there today, which was the first detoxification program on the East Coast to use acupuncture mm -hmm. um, to detoxify um, um, heroin addicts. And before I let you go, young people in activism, particularly in the Latino community, a lot of people say that young people are really not active in the area of activism and, and, and social justice and that whole movement. How would you counter that? Um, I, you know, I, I think that there is um, some organizations that are coming together. I think there's some individuals. I think that Rebel Diaz is one of our artists, a very young person that's out there talking to young people in their language. I think that the Carmona twins are coming out with Millie and the Lords, an independent film, which kind of pays tribute to, to the young lords. So young people are out there um, um, not as connected and not as visible as we were, but there are pockets of young people doing their work. All right. Well, Mickey Melendez, thank you for coming by and sharing thank with you. us a little pleasure. bit about it and a little history lesson at the same time. Thank you. All right. And guess what? Got to take a little bit of a break, but uh, afterwards we're going to take a look at a unique art project that you don't want to miss. But first, let's take a look at a first-hand look at the unveiling of the Young Lord's Way. Our cameras were there, and Bronxnet correspondent Arlene Makoko has more. A 
it's a, it's a great time for us to come together, but more importantly, it's a great time to celebrate where we've been and where we're going. We're all professionals. We're all in different you know, areas. We're still impacting, we're still making a difference, and hopefully we continue to be a vision and a mission and an inspiration for the younger people. Richie Perez was a professor. He was had a master's and a PhD, and he was also a teacher in Monroe High School. And he taught at a lot of colleges and taught the young people from the street that the education was the way to go. So we took over the church and we held it for 11 days and it became a symbol, especially for that generation of Latinos. You know, it, it had an amazing ripple effect that we never anticipated. And certainly the street renaming today, I would never have thought that was going to happen. Don't look at me. Your hair's a bit frizzy today. Oh, You should pick that up. <laughs> oh, you're such a dork. Loser. Here, let me help you with that. Oops. <laughs> Every day, kids witness bullying. Oh, look. Your crush is looking oh, at you. <laughs> Poor you. They want to help, but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you. No one Teach your kids you. how to be more than a bystander. Visit stopbullying.gov. Brush, brushy, brush, brushy, brush, brush, brush. Every day and every night. Brush, brushy, brush, 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 brush. Now it's your turn, it's time. Guess what you gotta do? Uh, Look at your toothbrush, and then take your brushy brush your teeth. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. And we are back here on Open. Darren Jaime here with you. Well, based in the Bronx, the TAG Public Arts Project specializes in maximizing the exposure of artists it represents by showcasing their fine, upscale urban art in gallery, non-gallery spaces, and urban communities that embrace concept of live art productions for installation in legal public spaces. Here now to tell us more is the founder and creator uh, director of TAG Public Arts Project. We've got Sincero Beltran and urban artist Louis Lamboy and James Sexa Rodriguez. And uh, thank you to have uh, thank you guys for coming and sharing with us. Darren, thank you for yeah. having us. So we got some things behind us and as we look around we see well you you break it down for us. Okay, well first and foremost, TAG Public Arts Project is about enhancing the visual landscape of urban communities with art. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that hip hop started out in the Bronx and we want to bring it back home. Uh, there's a Bronx Renaissance that's alive and well right now and we just want to kick it up a notch and take it to the next level. And not only that, but take uh, abandoned walls, walls that probably have been vandalized or just in a state of decay that are not vandalized or just properties in general where the landlords are willing to support us because they love our projects. Mm -hmm. um, not only that, we also are implementing a peer mentoring program for like the younger generation to educate them on how to do things the, the right way as well. Right. Um, so behind us basically are perfect examples of our fine art background training. And then besides that, we also do mural productions as well. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we just want to take in, in the Bronx and just spread it all over the place. You know, we've been blessed enough that we've had actually artists from all, all over the world. We've had people from Iran, from London, from right. Italy, Barcelona, you know. And that's what I was going to ask you, because how, how hard has it been or how easy it has it been to tap into artists to really join you in, the, in, the, in, in this project? Um, pretty much it's, uh, it, it, that, that part is the easiest part, because um, when you're an artist and um, you're out there, it's a pretty tight-knit community, so artists network and they get to know each other, they collaborate a lot. Um, we actually paint in another uh, borough, the Busher Collective, we paint mm -hmm. on Queens, man, so um, we're, we're, we're active in other co uh, communities and other boroughs, but 
we want to bring it back to the Bronx where it all started. We don't want to fall behind. Um, there's plenty of uh, places where tourists and visitors go to appreciate wonderful street art and urban art, and but the Bronx is still not there. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we're starting something now and want to get it to the level where everyone's going to come visit us as well. And we had a perfect example this past weekend when we celebrated uh, the Music and Arts Festival on Glebe Avenue, um, and it was a, a wonderful turnout. And when came out, politicians came out. They come to see. Wait, what's going on over here? You know, they, they're not used to seeing this. Right. The community embraced it so much. It was like, we want to see more. Well, I want to talk about that community mm -hmm. buying because yeah. you talked a little bit about vacant buildings, putting some art on, on buildings and, you know, buildings that may not necessarily be used, mm -hmm. getting the landlords, you know, buy in to really say that. How big is the community bought into the project and, and, and supporting? I mean, th uh, this Saturday pass was just a perfect example of that. Um, matter of fact, one of the property owners that gave us an entire building He's a Bronx Chamber of Commerce member, Bob Beter, and he's also the president of um, for the 45th Pre Precinct uh, Community Board. And, you know, we had the permits, streets were closed down, we had uh, two DJs, the community came out in droves, there were people coming in from outside the Bronx. I mean, people were loving what we were doing, people were taking pictures up against the walls, and they were, you know, very grateful. They were thanking us over and over again mm -hmm. about bringing all this beautiful color and art and bringing life to their neighborhood. I mean, we had a, a, Senate, a state Senator Klein came by. We had Aurelia Green from the Bronx Borough President's Office came by. Um, we had some representatives from the 45th Precinct came over as well. And one of the things that we also implemented is um, uh, addressing the issues with uh, the Bronx skyline. We even did the rooftop of the building mm. that was, um, you know, uh, not in a great state, and it was it looked it looked like an eyesore. And we put fine upscale urban art on these walls. So now, when you're on the six train going downtown between Zuriga and Casa Hill, you see fine art on the rooftop. Just was going to ask, where mm -hmm. can we see some of this great work? Oh, well, you can see. Uh, well, we got a couple of locations in the Bronx, including Glebe, and we're going to be working, um, doing some other you know spots in the Bronx but we're, we're focusing in the Bronx and what we could do or what you could do is get onto our list where you'll see and every time we do something or you want to be involved you can actually get on the list and see what we're doing and come out. Mm -hmm. as, to, as, a seg as a segue to what he's saying perfect place for you to go to right now you go to tagpublicartsproject.org or if you're an artist and you're looking to submit your work for review you can send it to TAG Public Arts Project at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And not only that, we have walls at uh, <coughs> uh, 1401 between Ferris Place and Butler Place in the Bronx, at 2100 Glebe Avenue in Westchester, and the Bronx as well. Currently, we're working on a new upcoming project. Uh, there's a wall that's on 134th Street and Bruckner Boulevard mm -hmm. that's right the, behind the McDonald's. It's 86, 86 feet long by 20 feet high. And for that project, uh, it's going to be, you know, Sincero Me, uh, Zemad, Sexer, John Crash Matos, and Coke Two. Mm -hmm. And these are renowned artists. And not only that, when we also say for uh, in gallery exhibits, mm -hmm. in um, October 24th through November 8th at the Andrew Freeman Complex, we're actually curating TAG Public Arts Project first big uh, uh, event there in two ballrooms that are probably over 3,000, 4,000 square feet, over 20 feet high. Mm -hmm. The same five artists are going to be doing this mural in uh, uh, upcoming. Uh, once again, me, Zimat, Sexer, John Crash Matos, and Cope 2 uh, are going to be exhibiting there as well, and it's being sponsored by Modelo. Unfortunately, when people think about art and walls, one of the main things that come to mind is graffiti. Mm -hmm. Do you guys feel like right now that you're doing something that's also like breaking down and br bridging that gap to understand to give a, a better awareness that you know all art is not graffiti and graffiti while graffiti mm -hmm. is considered some art that you can take it and make it into a positive way in terms of doing buildings and fixing buildings <coughs> so do you feel like you're you're really giving That's a cultural good. awareness to people yeah. oh yeah oh yeah. well the term graffiti is a legal act uh, what we do is more aerosol art aerosol art and street art which is totally different from graffiti so when when people mention graffiti you know we have graffiti backgrounds that from way mm -hmm. back, but mm -hmm. now we do the aerosol art where mm -hmm. it's on a legal basis. We and, both started um, on the subways yeah. and the streets, yeah. and 
you know. We oh, you were, did? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we were in the 80s. And, we're, um, we're about 35 years in on this game. <laughs> yeah. Grew yeah, up in the Bronx, is, and life. that was pretty much, um, you know, growing up in the Bronx, there's not a lot of outlet, creative outlets. So you, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're an artist by nature, um, a lot of times when you're raised in the ghetto and, you know, urban settings, you're going to fall into this type of uh, an outlet. Right. Um, you know, you, you, you do your thing. I mean, it was illegal, and, um, you know, we did our thing. But, you know, we got formal training, and our horizons expanded to different areas, and now we're doing, you know, we work right. as professional artists. And now, and now you have the ability to actually show other people the, the, the way. You know, and then tell which them is one of our big goals is a mentoring program for the kids to, you know, come out, because you never know who you're going to inspire. You know, these kids need, the city doesn't have enough programs or mentoring programs or creative outlets for children in the um you know in the inner city mm -hmm. we just don't all right so we got to get out of here because we got a few Absolutely. more seconds left but before we leave tell people about how they can get in touch with you and, and what you got coming around the corner okay so once again you could go to tagpublicartsproject.org and uh to see updates on what's coming up and you could submit your portfolios to tag public arts project at gmail.com for review mm -hmm. and once again just to let everybody know we also produce TG spotlights on every artist that paints live so we also give them something to help them take their art career to the next level all right well thank you guys for coming and yeah. sharing very thank much you, with you. absolutely thank you very thank much you and we'll be seeing you thank soon you. all right absolutely thank you very, thank much. You very much appreciate it Good thank to you have for open you. Right. oh no, glad to have you open here Listen, we want to move from arts to entertainment and we want to take a moment to remember comedian and actor Robin Williams who passed away Monday morning at the age of 63, an American film and stage actress known for her distinctive husky voice and sultry looks, Lauren Bacall. Robin Williams was 63 years old, and when we came to know him through such shows such as Mork and Mindy, and then we knew him to the big screen as Mrs. Doubtfire, and they all, he was a uh, one that was well known for his comedic acts. He took his life on Monday, and the entertainment world and the rest of the world it continues to mourn his passing. Lauren Bacall passed away last night at the age of 89. We'll take a look at both of them right now. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. Lauren Bacall and Robin Williams. Well, it's been a pleasure coming to your homes. Unfortunately, we are out of time. We want to thank our guests for joining us, and most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recablecast at 10 p.m. on Cablevision's Channel 67, Verizon Files, Channel 33. Watch us anytime also on the World Wide Web at www.bronxnet.org. We encourage you to have a great week. But most of all, don't forget to keep your heart, your mind, and most of all, this channel wide open. Darren Jaime saying take care. God bless. <laughs>